I've been informed we are on. We are recording. What a miracle. Just imagine there's this machine that Tatiana has and it's uh, photographing, tape making sound even, and then it's going into the cyber world, wherever that is. I'll give you my profile because uh, usually when you're in a police lineup, they not only want a full face, but they want your profile. They used to call me the great profile. Just kidding, but in case you see that somewhere, you'll know there he is, let's avoid him. All right, so what is this big deal about the laws of returning or going earlier? Well, one of the really wonderful things that I think Ron, that's L. Ron Hubbard, hit upon was the idea that when a person has a problem or an upset or something that is really distressing them and they would really like to get it handled quickly because it's, it's, it's unpleasant. And they know that if they go to a regular mental, spiritual practitioner whose business it is to help them, it's going to cost them whatever and maybe it won't be handled well and maybe it will. But one thing that's really quick is you, you say to the person, well, tell me about that. Blah, 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 I'm having trouble, a lot of trouble. I can't catch catfish. I can't catch rat. I'm having trouble catching catfish. Okay. Can you think or, of an earlier time when you had trouble catching catfish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Tell me about it. Can you find or look for an earlier and similar time that you were having trouble catching catfish? No, I, I don't think there's any. Wait a minute. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Mm, terrible. When I was a little kid, we were out in the boat trying to catch catfish, and the boat tipped over, and I almost drowned, and trouble with catfish and oh it's terrible and now oh, tell me about that okay I will tell you all about it well, at that time I thought I don't ever want to get in another boat and I don't give a darn about catching catfish but as it turned out later there was a big deal in my family during the depression we needed the fish we eat them, and I had to go out in boats, but um, always running into trouble with catfish. And you know what? I think it was all because of that time I almost died <laughs> trying to catch these lousy fish. And I had no real interest, but my dad and brother were big on it, and it was really foolish. And as I look back on it now, <laughs> there we were thrashing around in the water. Uh, you'd think the catfish were trying to catch us. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, how we discovered how to do that? I mean, it's so simple. You do it for anybody about any subject they're having trouble with. You don't have to be a class 12 auditor to do that. Nobody, those are just words anyway, class 12. You don't have to be highly experienced um, Scientology or Dianetic practitioner to do that. To do it with anybody that's having difficulty with something. It's not guaranteed that we'll always do that, but if you do it well and you help and encourage the person to travel in time to get to the earliest moment they can find of that problem, and then even ask them to go a little earlier than that, get some ideas about how the problem came into existence. You can do a lot, which is really uh, one of the things that appeals to me a lot is 
A lot of people who know how to help a lot of people. That's, I think that's neat. You don't have to have this as a profession. Maybe you work as a, but you also have this, and the people around you do better because you help them occasionally and they're like, oh, this guy, how'd you learn to do that? And that's how it just spreads. You do a little good here and a little there, and you're not trying to make customers or patients or religious conversion. Or, I baptize you in the name of the Church of Scientology. Now get your wallet out. <laughs> Where's your money? I want the money. Then we'll baptize you. Okay, so we don't do that. We just, I, by day, I work as a land surveyor or a construction engineer. By night and on the weekend, I may fool around with Dianetics and Scientology. Or when I'm on the job, I may use some of what I know, Scientology and Dianetics, to just do a little bit to help. And that's good. That We get a lot of people doing that. that we tend to have a more, possibly a better, more optimum world. Okay. So Ron came up with a simple idea. Go earlier. If you stay at, at the present moment disturbance, it'll get usually as solid as a piece of steel. But if you get back to where it all started, when it began, that's magic. The point when something comes into existence is magic. Try it and do it yourself. You don't even need to have someone do it on you. You can take something if you want to. Maybe you don't need to. Don't then. But you could do it. You could do it on others. You could do it on a family member just to see. Perform an experiment. Maybe you'll fail. So what? Won't hurt, won't hurt anybody at all. Okay. So that was something that Ron passed along. Um, I think some of it may have been found in psychoanalysis, possibly other things, but he made it very simple. He took an idea that you can do that, and when you get toward the beginning or the basic thing, it'll blow. Understanding will occur, and person will feel better. That was one thing he did. And coincidentally with that was the notion of present time and how different things appear to a person when and if they literally get into present time. Present time being this moment right now that will instantly become the past. But it's now, 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 now. That's present time. Now because of a lot of different things that happen to people, or may have happened to people, um, usually connected with suffering, pain, shock, illness, death, injury, and so forth. These experiences tend to, don't take my word for this, I'm just, this is a theory. Those experiences tend to trap in the past whatever that was. This is almost like a part of you ceases to continue in the time stream. You were on your way to work and a car ran you over and almost killed you. You never got to work. You were in the hospital for six months. That, so you got better and it's 10, 15 years later, but some of you could still be back there, still having a certain effect whenever you see a car, whenever you go near a street, whenever you see a hospital, any of the factors that are in it can still be influencing your life. Not necessarily, could be. So, that's not present time. That's past, and it's there, and it can be influencing present time, so that all of your awareness, all of your attention units, if you will, all of your sense of here and now, aren't all there. And the magic is if you 
do that which gets all of what a person consists of pretty much into present time, they will be ecstatically, immeasurably, wondrously alive. They will say, I've never seen life the way it looks. Everything is so bright, so brilliant. People look so charming and interesting. And all the things that I thought were crappy and rough, everything just looks amazing. It's like I'm seeing creation for the first time as it really is. And to some degree that is really true. So one of the big things that Hubbard developed were various ways to help a person get right into present time. And when they did, they would be like, wow! So this is what being alive is really like. There are all sorts of statements that people make when this happens. Or, I'm enlightened, I see life. The Buddha came present time. So one of the big pushes was if a person was interested, like maybe they were depressed in life because of the death of various people in their life that they never got over. They're permanently grieving about death and loss of people, a pet, a dog, another person, an ally. And a lot of their attention is stuck when that happened, that shock. And it's very easy, if you know how to do Dianetics, to relieve that. Or if they're in heavier experiences that have unconsciousness, pain, and all kinds of terrible stuff going on. So anyway, the whole idea of Dianetics was to free up, free people from those experiences, those few, perhaps, experiences that are preventing them from being in present time. And if you did succeed in doing that, the person would be a hell of a lot clearer and a hell of a lot more alive, a hell of a lot happier, and much more functional, much more intelligent, much more capable of operating because here and now is real. They aren't looking through layers of unconsciousness and sort of hypnotism that occurs when we're shocked tremendously. Oh, that's out of the way. They're now looking at the real thing, the illusion called life, which we all go around making real. But underneath it all could very well be an illusion that is insubstantial. But our business is to make it real and we know how to do it. We don't have to think about doing it. We do it. Because that's life. If you, you know, if you see a bunch of actors on the stage wearing makeup and costumes and one of them is killing another and so forth, hey, wait a minute. You go up on the stage, you take off the makeup, you see that the knife is made of rubber, you take off the clothes, oh, he's an old, and you see that it was an illusion, but it was made to look so real that people in the audience are sobbing hysterically when Hamlet dies. I sobbed hysterically when I saw Hamlet die and, and uh, they're carrying his body off and uh, someone says, now dies a noble heart. Oh. People were, and yet all they were looking at were a bunch of actors pretending that the Prince of Denmark had just died or been killed and that it was very sad and it re-stimulated all the things that they've lost and that have died and so forth. And people all over the theater, there was a great actor, um, this was back in the 1940s, on stage. And, uh, so. It's a small leap from that to realize that Earth, the universe, the world is a big act. That somehow, unknowingly, it's being put there. That everything in it, including us, is we're all the actors and here's all this stuff. And it's our job.
to make it real for one another so that the play really is the thing. You know, people say, come on, you're not really going to die. There's no such thing. You're not really... That, that's too steep a gradient. We don't want to take away the illusion. We actually want to acknowledge that it's solid, even though it isn't. So that's where we enter into um, possibly getting close to the that created, that's creating continuously all of this. Again, that's a theory, a hypothesis, but it's one of the things that um, Scientology, as a science of knowing how to know, examines, and you can examine for yourself and decide, is it real? Or am I making it real? Are we all making it really real? So there are sort of, in a sense, I would describe that there are three universes. There's the one that we all say is here. That's called the third universe, because Tatiana and I can agree I hope, that we're here today and that the floor is solid. We're not falling through it into the void. So that's the thing everybody says, yeah, 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 even though there are some people who don't agree and they're in insane asylums and jails and all other things. But most people, yeah, it's a solid thing. But then there's my universe, the one that is deep within me. And that if you were to say, you really know Phil, or I really know you, this is my personal universe. It's filled with my dreams, my imaginings, my beliefs, my mental, spiritual, physical, non-physical creations. Like I envision a perfect world where every woman in it loves me and there are no men to challenge. And I can love all of them in return. That's one of my universes. And I think you'd find most men and most women have a perfect universe like a woman. Here's a man that won't always tell me what to do. Won't presume that because he's bigger and stronger physically, he's more intelligent or more capable, and I should shut my mouth and listen to him. Women have universes too, and they are often suppressed. So we go around, um, whether we mean to or not, suppressing each other's universes. There's my universe. There's this one, which is everybody's, the physical universe. And then there's Tatiana and everybody else's universe. And if I want to really know and help a person, I have to make our space together so safe that they're willing to let me really know what's really going on in their universe. The one that is sacred to them and them only. The one that gets kicked around and validated, sometimes acknowledged, but often failed to be understood and appreciated by other people because their universe isn't succeeding either. This is the one that we have to agree to, and that's unfortunate because although it's important, your universe, Tatiana's universe, my universe are also in every other person's. And one of the big deals in Scientology was to help recover and make right and healthy and acceptable and your own universe, which in the face of all the invalidation and evaluation from other universes, in this universe, it goes like, yeah, I don't have any more hopes, dreams, ideals, beliefs, and possibilities. I've learned it's dog-eat-dog -dog world, and it's about money, and fame, and fortune, and fuck everybody, and no. If you can open up another person's universe and bring it back to life, you are bringing back their ability to imagine, to create, to dream, to idealize, do all the things that an awareness, awareness unit is capable of. It's capable of creating its own universe. Not something where someone else can jump into it and say, 
that ain't going to work, or get rid of that, or stop that. That's in this universe. So, the real recovery that Scientology promised was all of the additives, which I think uh, Marty Rathbun was talking about in one of his beautiful essays about Scientology and Ron. Um, the awareness of we're an issue it has a lot of additives, things that aren't really it, that could be mistaken for it, or it can mistake, it can mistake itself and think, I'm that, I'm that, I'm additives. But when the additives get away, what we're talking about is something that in its own native state is total, totally simple. It's not a complex. Well, it's going to take 26 years of therapy to figure that out. The Ding an sich in German. The thing in itself is an absolute simplicity. You've got to know that. And again, the experiment is to see if that's true. It isn't true because Hubbard said so, or it's in his book. Or that Phil, supreme bullshit artist, no. It doesn't make it true because when that happens, we now have a religion with faith and belief. Scientology is not a religion. I know it's busted its ass in order to have tax-exempt status and be free from the laws of many countries and states to prove that it is a religion, and I'm here to prove it isn't. It's a, science, a scientific philosophy formulated by its axioms aimed at the state of knowing how to know, restoring the awareness of awareness unit, if there is one, to its own universe. Its ability to have not only its own universe, but the third universe, and willing to grant beingness to the universe of every other being, which is not what we're doing now. What we're doing now is making this universe more important than anything. What are you going to be when you grow up? How are you going to make a living? You're going to get enough money to live? Don't talk to me about philosophy and idealism and all that bullshit. Dog eat dog. Survive. No. An awareness of where you is trying to survive can't get any crazier than that because it's not alive or dead. It has nothing to do with living or dying. It's just pure awareness. It's not a something. It's an idea. Whatever. Whatever it is, though, that's not. Now, it can be anything. But the idea is we're trying to, um, for those, and I don't know that it's for everyone, I don't practice that as a belief. We don't want to turn Scientology into a belief, have faith in wrong, have faith in Scientology, have faith in the church. That's other churches. They take uh, philosophy, turn it into that. Scientology is not a religious philosophy. I'm here to say that, and I say that it's true. Because a religion or a religious philosophy, I mean, you can call anything a religion or a religious philosophy. You can say, my desire to eat hard salami is a religion. And I have faith in it. Believe. I must have it. I know that it will save the world. No, you can call anything you want to. Calling Scientology a, a religious philosophy or a religion with a church, you can do that. It just doesn't happen to be true. It's a lie about something. Like I can call physics a religion. Well, you can do that, but it doesn't make physics a religion. For some people, it becomes a religion because they get so over the edge concerning physics that they start to have faith and belief in the laws of physics instead of these are laws only until we prove otherwise. I noticed that Tatiana is touching the camera, but she says, okay. So, yeah, you can call anything you want a religion. Don't call Scientology a religion just because you want tax-exempt status 
and freedom from all kinds of laws and restrictions about who can practice what. Ra oh, I was going to save this for the last thing. We were talking about present time. So yes, getting helping a person to get into present time, to get some restoration of their own universe and the ability to tolerate the universes of others and to have an appreciation for present time as this is here and now. That's the game. This is present time. Okay? I think at this point, with your kind permission, we should take a break. Time out.